The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials in ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Today we have a brand new release, a great video on painting heads and hands with William A. Schneider. I hope you enjoy this. Hi, I'm Bill Schneider, and welcome to this video. You know, Norman Rockwell once said, they'll forgive anything except heads and hands. So in this video, we're going to do what there are a lot of portrait videos that do, and that is work on a head, but we're also gonna work on the structure and the gesture of the hand. So let's go. But to get started, I'm gonna put my hat on, not as a fashion statement, this came up earlier today, but rather, if I have a hat on, it makes my pupils open up and it does two good things for me. One, it lets me see color better. And two, it softens my focus so I can judge edges better. So it's not a fashion statement. I'm also gonna wear my painting glasses. I advise all the young people not to age. I don't think they're following my advice. So let's get started. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of the hand. You know, the head is hard enough. Um, you've got two main bones to the head. You've got the top part of the skeleton down to, to the teeth, and then you've got a jawbone, which has the bottom teeth, and that's it. And that alone is hard enough. But the hand has other issues. And I have here a little plastic skeleton hand. Um, and I thought that this would be useful because you can see it in three dimensions. If you just see a, a drawing or a picture of the hand skeleton, it looks like it's all flat, but it's really arched. The bones of the wrist here, there's eight bones, the carpals, and they are in an arch and they kind of are designed to facilitate the rotation of the hand against the bones of the forearm. This thick bone is the radius, it's the bottom part of the radius, and it's on the thumb side. And this thinner bone is the bottom part of the ulna. It's thin on this end, it's very thick on this end, that's the elbow bone. It kind of wraps around here and it runs down. And you can actually see this bone from almost any angle that you see the hand. One thing worth noting is that these bones are wider than the carpals. So the wrist kind of goes in from the arm. So that's worth noting. The other thing worth noting, you can see that this is arched. So the wrist bones are arched and so are these bones the metacarpals that uh, connect to the fingers. I used to think that those were fingers when I first saw pictures of skeletons. And uh, I wondered why they had such long hands, but it's really, these are the parts that are covered by the palm. Another thing worth noting is that the thumb is not in the same plane as these. The thumb is set off at a 30 degree angle so that it can oppose the fingers. And that gives us our ability to grip things. 
I guess the other thing worth noting is that if you look at the bottom part, the um, bottom part of the carpels forms the back side of the arch. So it's arched this way, and there are, are these two projections here. There's actually a third one that's kind of hidden away inside the palm. Um, and those anchor tendons that pull the hand like that. And so they're strong anchor points, but anytime you see the hand resting on something or if you're seeing it pushing like that, you see the sense of, the, of that arch here. I guess the last thing I want to point out using the skeleton is that these bones, the metacarpals, the fingers actually rotate on the surface. So when the fingers go down, these, the knuckles are really the head of this bone. It's not the back of this bone. And so you can sort of feel the separation as the finger bones the more distal or the further you are from the wrist, that bone is always rotating on the bone that's closer. So this part rotates on, on this joint. This part rotates on that joint to the extent that it actually rotates. Very little movement on the end points. And I guess the last thing I'll point out is that each of the fingers has three segments. The thumb only has two. I've seen artists sometimes try to insert a third joint in the thumb. There is no third joint. If you put it in, it's not going to look right. So that's the skeleton. If we take a look, I've drawn out some of the underlying tendons and connections, and I'm not going to go through every the name of everything what I actually encourage you to do is what I did. I was having trouble with hands. And so I got the George Bridgman Book of 100 Hands. You can buy it from Dover Press. It's cheap. I want to say it's like $9.95. And I copied every illustration in that book. It took me about six months. And so I learned the anatomy. And, um, you know, they say paint what you see. But if you know what's causing the lumps and bumps you see, it makes it easier to identify them. So I will point out a couple of things. This is the back of my hand. You can see I made an outline. But the first thing is there are three, the, the tendons that run along the back of the hand, I'll make my hand rigid. You can see the three tendons branching to a point here. That's the extensor communis digitorum. Not that you need to memorize the name, but that uh, pulls the fingers back and up. And the pinky has its own separate set of muscles or a separate set of tendons so that it, does, it can move more independently than the other three. The thumb uh, from the back has a couple of visible marks so you've got this muscle here, this fleshy part, which is the dorsal interosseous, meaning dorsal means back, interosseous means between bones. So it's between the uh, bone leading up to the fingers and the bone leading to the thumb. And that doesn't go away. If the th thumb is closed, it bulges out even more. So that's visible from the back. And this muscle here, the abductor minimi digiti, meaning the thing that pulls the little finger, minimi, little, digiti, little, I mean finger. So this is visible also from the back. And so that's all I'll point out about this. If you want to, to learn the names of each of them, you can stop the DVD and spend some time on this, but I'm not gonna go through it. So let's look at the next chart. So I made these drawings in preparation for this video. And I'll just hold this here. No, I won't. I'll stick it up. Again, there's my hand in the drawing. And I'm showing you the arch of the back of the, the hand. 
and I'm showing you the arch of the uh, two projection points. And this is kind of stylized. And oh, by the way, there's a whole bunch of tendons that run into here. You'll see those in a minute. Um, and so this provides a pathway between those two projecting bones. So now, let's go to the palm view. So I started making these and I was drawing them all in charcoal and lettering them in ink. And then I figured out after this one that it would look better if I just did them all in ink. So I did that and I'm not I'm definitely not going through the entire list, but here's my hand. And what I'm showing you is that there is this bundle, just like it was on the back where it branched out into three. You've got the uh, ligaments that come up here on the palm side that pull the hand this way. And so the palm uh, has that structure, but sitting on top of those ligaments, you've got two groups of muscles. You've got the, the three muscles that pull the thumb in different directions. And I'm not gonna go through the names of all of them. You can look, stop the tape if you want and look at it. Um, but that is the thaner eminence. So there's a big bulge of muscles here. And on the little finger side, you've got a bulge of muscles here, the hypothaner eminence. So when you're painting, or drawing, you wanna make sure you get those two bulges. And all together, it makes the, the palm, this was our first drinking cup back in caveman days, it was our palm. It's cup shaped. And so if you make it flat, it's not gonna look right. So, So if we're looking at the hands from the thumb side, I, I, you can see some of the muscles and bulges we talked about. You can see this from the back. That's the first dorsal interossei. And this is the abductor pollicis, pollicis being Latin for thumb. So that pulls the thumb but that's visible from the back and from, from the side. And even if it's going away from you, you see some of these things. The other thing that's worth noting, see if I can make these pop out, get some shadow on them. Okay, there are two tendons that run down to the thumb and there is a hollow in between them. See where I pushed that in? At the, used to call that the snuff box, because I guess guys could put snuff there and snort it up or something. Um, but that is the, the space between the extensor brevis pollicis and the extensor longus pollicis, but it's visible from the exterior. Again, I encourage you to get that Bridgman book and do what I did. You know, as artists, anytime we run into a problem, we have two options. Our, option, our first option is to try to avoid it. So I was having trouble with hands. I could have tried to avoid ever having a pose that had hands in it. And uh, the other option is to attack your weakness. Whatever is giving you trouble, attack it and master it. And that's what I chose to do. So here we're looking at the hand from the little finger side. And remember I showed you that bone, this bone, the pisiform bone. That's where this tendon, the flexor carpi ulnaris, meaning the muscle flexor that goes to the carpus, carpal bones, and it's on the ulna side, which
which is the, this side, but it connects to that pisiform bone. And then there's a ligament that kind of holds everything in. And you can see the structure of the hand. I guess another thing worth mentioning here, in general, uh, if you can make these structures as straight lines, rather than trying to have bulbous curved lines, the hands are gonna look better. That works for anything, but particularly for hands. You know, you can simplify the fingers to be sort of tapering objects, but if you make, if you really emphasize the knuckles and so on, and it's easy to do because we see them, there's shadows around some of the folds, and um, if you do that, it tends to, particularly for feminine hands, be less attractive. So, as always, see how square you can make the round. So, talking about the thumb, this bone is not part of the visible thumb. This bone is the metacarpal that's hidden underneath. And then the bone here uh, has some curve to it. And then this little bone at the tip. But notice how much bigger the thumb is than the other fingers. Thumb has a lot of, uh, a lot of hard work to do. And so it needs strength to it. And so structurally it's bigger, it's thicker, and it's more well braced. So here you can see this is under here. This bone is here. And the fleshy part of the end of the thumb is all wrapped around this thing. The fingers basically are the same way. Here's, there's kind of a curve to the bone back here. So the metacarpals are arched not only this way, but there's a slight arch to them this way as well. Same thing with the fingers. And each of the more distal bones, as you go out, this bone slides on this bone, this bone slides on this bone, this bone slides on that bone. And so you can conceive of it as a series of steps. You can even simplify that into being one sort of line. And we'll see when we start painting. And I guess the last thing that we need to, or no, second to last thing, <laughs> that we need to consider is uh, sort of the structure of the, of the bones. So this is on the palm side. So we're looking at a finger bone. So here's the finger bones. There are connecting ligaments that are holding these bones together. And then there's also connections on the inner side. Then there's sheathing that goes to the tendons Remember, there's a, a common tendon that comes from here all the way down, but th that runs all the way out to the tip, and that pulls the bones in really in order. So the first thing that'll happen is it'll start to raise this way. The second thing is it'll start to pull this way, and the third thing is the little one will collapse. And then finally, there's uh, kind of this crisscrossing wrapping so it's designed to strengthen and hold all of this stuff together. You know, our hands take a beating. In, you know, if you see somebody that's worked hard all their life, the knuckles will be enlarged, you'll see the veins enlarged, you see the wear and tear on the hands. So there's a lot of protective stuff to hold those bones together and in place. You don't see this kind of wrapping and sheathing, you know, around the spine or anything. So, you can conceive of this, here's my hand again, uh, that the fingers, first of all, they're separate. 
A lot of people will try to draw the fingers as if they came together right at a V. There's a space between them. And they kind of angle to a point down here between the radius and ulna. And they do that so that when you fold them together, it will kind of fold in towards that point. Otherwise, they wouldn't fit. So you want to get that spacing between. And I, I should have whited out this because I was kind of correcting it. On this side, notice that the webbing of the palm goes all the way up to where the bones end. And oh, by the way, it's not where the bones end. If I fold this down, the webbing on the palm goes up about a third of the way on the bone of the finger. So the webbing of the palm goes up further than the finger bone. And as a result, when it folds in, it creates this extra fold here. And again, it, it folds towards that point. The tighter you fold it, the more it goes in. So when you have a fist, the more you fold it, the more pressure there is on the skin above the uh, tips of the metacarpals and sort of, sort of stretches it. And, you know, I studied martial arts. You can break boards with your bones. Not at first. <laughs> Takes some practice and hardening things up. So now, the last thing I want to show you <clears throat> is this. The hand was our first and, and only tool for millions of years. And it is, you know, beautifully designed, better than the knee. Um, so here's the upper bone of the arm, the humerus. And you've got the, the big bone at the top is the ulna, which hooks onto the humerus. It, it has like a grip that grips into the back of the bone so that as it folds down, the, the arm will only go in this direction. It will not, you can't get any rotation on that bone. But what you can get is 180 degree rotation because I, I can turn my thumb so it's facing straight down or facing straight up. Actually, even a little further than that because these two bones will rotate and flip over each other. So that allows for rotation in this direction. You also have really this curved structure for the two bones most of it being the uh, uh, radius, the bottom of the radius. And it allows this part, this rounded end of the metacarpals to rotate side to side. So you can get about 30 degrees between the two directions this way or that way. You also, so, so the hand will rotate this way and that way. It will also go this way and that way. And then it will also flip up or down. And here you've got probably close to 90 degrees. I don't know the exact amount. So we have great flexibility with our hands. Part of what makes it hard. But if you understand structurally what's happening then you can kind of understand when the model takes a particular position. So now we'll get back to painting the model. So we're going to paint a portrait of Lily, our model today. Lily is a dancer and has a natural, graceful, erect posture. But I'm going to do her head and I'm going to do her hand, as you see in the photo. And uh, I'm going to start by painting in the head. But the very first thing I'm going to do is just tone this canvas a little bit. So I'm going to mix up some paint. And what I want to do is get something that will be 
the general value and color of her flesh in the light. So I'm mixing up a grayed orange. I'm going to add some mineral spirits to it and just tone the canvas. That looks really dark now because it's on light canvas. But this will look more like her color and value. I think I need a little red in there too. And I'm not worried too much about getting the whole shape of her head because I'm going to wipe that down and then I'm going to let it dry for a little bit. Because I want kind of a dry surface that I can work on. And again, when I'm looking at her, I'm seeing her face as a light shape against the dark background. So it's a light against darks. Here we have exactly the opposite. We've got a darker shape against the light. So it makes this look very dark. But trust me, it's going to work out. Caucasians are about the value of a brown paper bag. So if I put my hand here, you see that my hand is actually darker, certainly the back, than this area. Okay, so now I'm going to start drawing Lillian and I'm using vine charcoal. The vine charcoal will just sort of evaporate into uh, this, but I'm going to, first of all, put in a general outline. And one thing that's a good idea, my life drawing teacher, Bill Parks, used to always say, see how square you can make the round. So I'm gonna do this kind of as straight lines and I'm trying to just, I'm going to really work from the inside out. And I want to make her head about the size of my hand. So I'm not going to make it that tall. And I want to leave room down here for her hand. In fact, maybe I'll make it a little bit shorter because it'll probably expand on me. And so I'm trying to get just sort of the boundaries on the outside, just so I have a starting point. I'm going to use the back end of a brush as kind of a measuring stick. And what I'm doing, just trying to get the width versus the height, which is about two to one of her face. So the width should be a little bit narrower. Maybe I'll put her down here. One. And I'm not even going to really use these outside measurements in the end, but I need to start to get a general idea so I know where to start the center line. So that's about right. So the width should be about here. It's a series of approximations. And I'm worried about being generally accurate, not precise. There's a difference between accuracy and precision. For example, I could say I'm five foot six point one eight two four seven inches tall. That's very precise. It's out to the fifth decimal point or whatever. Uh, better to say I'm about six two. That's generally accurate whereas the other was precise and precisely wrong. So I'm trying to be accurate, not precise. And she's got a little bit of a tilt to her head. So now I know where to put the center line. And I see that the center line is not straight up and down, but it's an angle. And I'm using the idea of an hour hand on a clock. 
So if this was a clock, I mean, this would be 12 o'clock, this would be three o'clock, this would be six o'clock and so on. So she's not at 12 o'clock, she's like 11.45. So the center line on her face really kind of goes like this. And I'm going to draw her from the inside out. So I'm going to get my vertical measurements. I'm going to put it over a little tiny bit. Let me erase that. By the way, if you have my fashion DVD, you're saying, what on earth? He talked specifically about not toning the canvas. What I'm doing today is not a broken stroke painting, it's a light and shadow painting. So by having this be kind of the color of her flesh in the light, as soon as I put a shadow pattern on there, it's gonna to start to give the illusion of three dimensionality. So, I'm measuring from bottom of chin to the line between the inside corners of her eyes and comparing it to the vertical and I see that it's about one and a third. So the distance from here, if this is one unit, would be about one and a third. Maybe it's a little tiny scooch higher. So I moved my thumb down on my measuring stick to raise her eyes. I think that'll work. So I think her eyes are on this line. And they're of course perpendicular to the center line. Now where are the eyebrows? I think they're about right here on this side. The eyebrows are not, they're not quite symmetrical with the center line. But I think they're like that, but I'm gonna measure it. So from top of eyebrow to top of head, is a little bit less than 50-50. So this distance, so I need it to be a little bit higher. If you just measure by eye, the odds are it's gonna be inaccurate. And I know some of you may have seen um, a great master like Dan Gerhardt's paint and it looks like he's just measuring everything by eye. It's because he's done 10,000 heads and his eye is better than most, better than mine. So I'm gonna measure I follow the carpenter's rule, measure twice, cut once. When I do carpentry, I find that no matter how many times I cut it, it never gets longer. So from top of eyebrow to bottom of nose, compared to base of nose to chin. And what I see, her nose is longer So this distance is shorter than this distance. And let me see how much shorter. It's like where the two eyebrows slope down, so they're kind of like that and like that. They're angling that way. So I think that it's the distance from here a little bit longer. And I know from bitter experience, students always want to rush through this part. Because let's face it, we all became artists because we wanted to be artistes. We wanted to be flamboyant and, and just throw paint on and have it land all in the right spots. 
If we don't measure in the beginning, then we're going to spend most of the time trying to correct until we finally abandon hope and, and just give up on it. So better to measure first. Take your time here. And then get it right so when you start to paint, you have to make less corrections. So I'm now measuring from base of nose to bottom of lower lip compared to lower lip to chin. And what I see, and by the way, the reason that I'm doing that is because on average, the distance from here to here is one eye width, as is the distance from here to the bottom of the chin if you don't have a beard. I'm doing something that on the average person is 50-50. On Lily, her mouth, she has very full lips, which are wonderful in a model. And so they're a little bit further down. So it's not quite 50-50, it's more like that. So I think the base of her lower lip is right here. So now I have vertical measurements. Now I need to find the distance between her eyes. Can you rotate just an eighth of an inch that way? Let's put the difference right there. Doing a great job modeling is one of the least easy things I know of. I've done it. When the model didn't show up, I actually sat and it drove me crazy. So I'm glad that there are people that are willing to do this because we'd be dead in the water without it. So what I see is that the distance between her eyes is a little bit longer than the distance from base of chin to the bottom of lower lip. And so now I'm getting horizontal measurements that are in the same scale as the vertical measurements. And so I think there's a corner of an eye here and a corner of an eye here. Bill Parks used to always say this. I heard this 10,000 times when I was in art school. For those of you that get back and look at your effort from a distance, for those of you that don't, and so I've got that burned into my brain to remind me to get back and look at what I'm doing so I have more perspective. Because if I'm right up on top of the canvas, I can't make good judgments. So now I'm gonna compare the width of the eye stage left, it's actually her right eye, but to me it looks left, compared to that space in the center. And I see it's almost the same width. And then the corner actually is out here. So I think her eye is about there. And when I squint down, so I'm squinting at her, I'll squint for the camera. I only want to paint what I see when I squint. That's what Sargent did. That's what Zorn did. That's even uh, Monet did that. There's photos of him looking out in the landscape and you think that he's just being very French, but he's really squinting at the landscape to simplify the masses. You want to squint for shape, you want to squint for edges, and you want to squint for value. You want to look with your eyes wide open for color, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So anyway, when I squint, her eyes are whisper soft. And that's the way I'm going to start them, even from the beginning. The normal human tendency is to want to open your eyes wider and stare to see better. And as artists, we want to do exactly the opposite. So what is the shape? It kind of goes up like this and across and like this. And it just this edge just sort of vanishes. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make sharp edges and notice I'm not putting in the lower lid 
If you put an oval around the eyes, you've immediately taken your brain into the land of symbols. The universal eye symbol, here I'll draw one, is an oval with a circle in it. If you ask a little kid, five-year-old kid, what's an eye look like, they'll draw that. If you ask a 60-year-old who's a non-artist, they'll draw the same symbol. You know, I tell a story, we must become as little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. And what I mean by that is, we have to look at the world the way an infant does. Now think of a, of a newborn baby, what does the baby see? The baby doesn't see things. The baby sees this moving mosaic of shapes and values and colors. So over time, the baby learns that if it's distressed, so if its diaper needs changing or if it's hungry or needs to be burped or whatever, uh, there's this reoccurring pattern of shapes and colors and values that takes care of it and it learns a name for that and it calls it mom. And then it starts to learn the name for other things. You know, where's your nose? Touch your nose, touch mommy's nose. Where's your ear? And we learn names for other things. Then starting at about the age of two and a half or three, we start to put together sentences combining these words that we've learned. So by the time we're four, we're no longer perceiving the real world. We're now perceiving these memorized symbols for the world. That's very useful if you're trying to survive in the wild as a cave person or in trying to survive in modern society as a non-cave person. It's really terrible if you're an artist because if you draw the symbol for eyes, it looks at best cartoony. And so what we wanna do is we wanna draw the shapes that will form the eye. So we wanna become as little children, as infants, in our perception of the world. And it's easier said than done. So there's these little tricks to help do that. One trick is if I don't put in the bottom of that lid, it tends to keep this out of symbol land and let me make judgments about angles and shapes and values. Angles, shapes, and values, and edges. So I think that this will start to form itself into eyes. And if you're really in the zone, it's hard to do if I'm talking like this. But if I'm really in the zone, sometimes I'll surprise myself because I'll be doing painting shapes and I'll go, oh my Lord, I just painted a nose. Um, that's where you want to be as an artist. About portrait paintings, Norman Rockwell once said, the viewer will forgive anything except heads and hands. When the heads and hands don't look right, the entire portrait looks stiff and tight, very unnatural. When proportions are not accurate, viewers will regard the work as amateurish. If you need help getting heads and hands just right, you'll be excited to discover the laser-focused instruction that artist William A. Schneider offers in the video course, Heads and Hands. Here you'll find new insights and shortcuts that will strengthen your drawing and painting skills. You'll be able to add Bill's expert techniques to bring expressive gestures into your artwork. In his entertaining yet thorough teaching style, Bill shares his best tips and tools so you have a solid foundation of knowledge that will help with every portrait painting you ever do. There's so much nuance to the human face. I mean, we evolved uh, to be able to express so much with our face. We're the naked ape. In fact, there was a famous book about that. And so we've got uh, movable eyebrows. The eyebrows tell you a lot about what somebody's thinking, you know, and here I'll look, you know, are they got a furrowed brow? Are they looking at you? Are they quizzical or whatever? I mean, you get these different movements of the eyebrows and the movements of the mouth. And we are so attuned to seeing these subtle changes that indicate the underlying emotion. And so uh, I find that incredibly intriguing. Bill shares everything he's learned through his decades as a professional artist so you can avoid the trial and error that other artists suffer through. First, he'll provide a crash course in the anatomy of hands so you understand how the underlying structures are designed. This is what will help you attain a sense of natural appearance and movement. 
Then you'll follow along with Bill to paint a portrait from life. You'll learn Bill's signature measurement sequence that'll help you nail proportions so that painting heads and hands becomes second nature to you. Bill shares his techniques on how to enhance and refine your observational skills, as well as his simple fixes for the most common errors. You'll see him demonstrate his two-step approach to mixing colors and how you can paint accurate and striking facial features. When you study heads and hands with Bill Schneider, you'll be gaining new skills that you'll use for the rest of your painting career. I hope that this has been useful. I was very fortunate in that when I went to the American Academy, I had one of the greatest uh, figure drawing teachers, Bill Parks. And later on, after I got out of that school, my friend Dan Gerhardt's told me that I should teach workshops, and I resisted. I didn't want to do it because I started late. You know, I was in my 40s at that point. And I told Dan, you know, I don't need the money. I don't want to do this. I want to work on my own art. And he said, no, no, no. You should teach for two reasons. One, you had great instructors and you owe it to the world to pass it on. And two, you will learn more by working with students than by just working with yourself. And I found both things to be true. Available on DVD and instant video. Order this video now and be on your way to overcoming the obstacles so many artists face when painting heads and hands. Well, this is a brand new video called Heads and Hand, a great tool for learning. That was William A. Schneider. You can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. And remember, today only, we have a special discount code, which is in the comments section. Now let's get right to our interview with William Schneider. Hi, I'm Bill Schneider. I am a, a painter by trade, oil and pastel and I'm most interested in figures and portraits, but I like everything else. I, I like everything to do with art, and I admire uh, artists in all different media and in all different styles, but for me, I love the figure in the, in the portrait. I would describe my style of painting as realism leaning towards Impressionism. I am, um, I'm not using the broken color approach of the French Impressionists, but I'm using more broken stroke kinds of things that um, I'm calling it Impressionism because it's not uh, traditional realism. And by traditional realism, I mean like the John Singer Sargent approach. We have a, a unified definite shadow pattern creating the illusion of three dimensionality. That's more of a light and shadow painting. Mine tend to have elements where the edges are broken or, or disguised. I'm just more interested in that. I think it's more attractive. And so that's what gives it sort of the impressionistic feel. My grandparents, when I was nine, bought me a set of oil paints and said, go out to the studio, which was my great grandpa's old studio, and you know, play with oil paint. I, on the other hand, would never give a nine-year-old kid a set of oil paints and say, go play someplace because they'll get over everything. You know, my use of color and paint uh, helps with, I guess, what you'd call my style. I, uh, when I was in art school at the American Academy, I was coached and instructed not to try to find a style. And the reason for that is if you try to say, okay, I'm gonna do things this way all the time, then you develop sort of mannerisms and uh, limit yourself. I was advised, and I think this is great advice, to just try to be honest. And that uh, just like everybody's handwriting is different, everybody's paint application will be different. And so if you try to find a style and stick to it, it will uh, limit you rather than helping you. So. I'm more interested in the way I apply the paint and the way I use the colors to try to uh, convey an image. And if somebody else looks at it and says, ah, that's a William Schneider painting, it must be his style, rather than trying to have a style, so to speak. What inspires me to paint now is the world. You know, I, I am most drawn to people. I think we're more interesting than landscapes or still lives although I do those as well. But uh, 
there's so much nuance to the human face. I mean, we evolved uh, to be able to express so much with our face. We're the naked ape. In fact, there was a famous book about that. And so we've got uh, movable eyebrows. The eyebrows tell you a lot about what somebody's thinking, you know. And here, you know, are they got a furrowed brow? Are they looking at you? Are they quizzical or whatever? I mean, you get these different movements of the eyebrows and the movements of the mouth. And we are so attuned to seeing these subtle changes that indicate the underlying emotion. And so uh, I find that incredibly intriguing and to try to capture it and paint because we paint in slow motion. You know, I'll be painting a model and, and she'll go through a hundred different expressions while she's sitting there and I have to kind of pick and choose. So it's interesting, it's challenging, but that's, that's what turns me on. The hardest thing about painting a portrait or a figure or anything for that matter is staying focused. You know, painting is, uh, in one sense, it's kind of a Zen activity. And what I mean by that is you have to be here now. You can't be there later and be putting strokes down. Uh, Richard Schmid calls this one activity licking, where the, your hand is making motions on the canvas. You're painting a stroke, usually the same stroke over and over and over, while the brain is somebody, someplace else completely different. So if I could just remember everything I know from the first stroke to the last stroke, I would do nothing but crank out masterpieces. But it's learning to, to be in the present and to be reacting and to have intent for each of those strokes. And whether it's a still life, a landscape, or a portrait or a figure, it sort of doesn't matter. Now, the thing that's a little more challenging with portraits and figures is not only being here now, but someplace in the back of your brain having this ongoing narrative that, okay, I'm here, I'm painting the model now, she's in front of me, but in my mind, she's not just a model sitting on a chair, this is Cleopatra sitting on a throne. And she's in the play, Romeo, you know, the uh, Mark Antony and Cleopatra, the Shakespeare play, and it's the scene before she's gonna be bitten by the ass, whatever it is, I've got this movie sort of playing in my head and so I have to be present and still have that movie circulating to capture that narrative. So uh, it's juggling those two things. Thanks for a challenge. The other subject matter for art that interests me, mm -hmm. I would say uh, I'd, in order would be portraits and figures, landscape, still life, and often what I do in my figurative work is include a still life in the, with the figure or do a figure outdoors. And so I'm including the landscape in with that. But it's really everything, you know. At the American Academy, they said, if you can paint a head, you can paint anything. And so we were expected to know how to do landscapes and still lives and figures and portraits. Although in the painting class, they never had us do landscape or still life. We were always working on the figure. I like oil. Um, I also love pastel. And each of those mediums reinforces the other. There are things you can do in oil that are devilishly difficult to do in pastel. Um, for example, to get a thin, rich, deep, transparent, warm, dark is a piece of cake in oil. You know, mix some transparent oxide brown with some ultramarine blue, let the brown predominate, add some mineral spirits to it, and you've got a nice thin transparent dark. Pastel, not so much. Um, I would say the thing that is the best about oil is it's so forgiving. You know, if you want to do something really hard, paint in watercolor. Because you put an edge down and you forget it and don't watch it and let it dry. Once you have an edge, you can't get rid of it. Uh, so there's no correcting in watercolor. You either get it right or you throw it away. Uh, oil paint, you know, I've had paintings that I've sent off to a gallery and they hadn't sold. And a couple
comes back a year later, and I look at it with uh, a year more of experience under my belt, I say, well, I know why that didn't sell. The values aren't right here, and I, I can fix it up. I can actually paint on top of it and correct it. And I've done that and uh, fixed up the piece that came back. It's now a year and a half old. Ship it out again, it sells right away. And so it's very, very forgiving. What I do sometimes is, uh, especially if I want to get some rich darks in the pastel, is I'll use my Terry Ludwig uh, Extreme Darks 2, I think is the set, which is the best darks there are. But I'll use those, and then I will paint over the top of it with alcohol, let that dry. So now I've got sort of this flat base in the pastel, and then I can do pastels on top of it. The thing that I find most difficult about painting with oil is everything. <laughs> you know, shape, value, color temperature, edge, composition. You're juggling five chainsaws. And, uh, you know, you've got to get the drawing right. That's the first thing that, you know, most people say, well, I don't know anything about art. But I know what I like. And what they like is accurate drawing, first and foremost. So if you don't have the right parts in the right place, forget everything else. But that, that takes you maybe 90% of the way there. But then you've got to have the values correct and in the right relationship. And you've got to have the edges in the right relationship. And you've got to have the color temperatures in the right relationship. And that just gets you to the point where, okay, now I have all my tools. How, what story am I going to tell with this? And so you've got to remember all the technical stuff and you've got to have that movie running in your head and um, you've got to be capturing the expression that reinforces whatever your narrative is, the gesture that reinforces it, the, uh, you know, accoutrements that, you know, if somebody's wearing old rumpled clothing, maybe that tells you that they've had a long, hard life or something. You know, it, you can reinforce all of these elements. So it's multi-layered. And uh, any one of them can be easy if it's working right. And any one of those elements makes it hard if it's not working right. The painting I'm most proud of is always the one that I just finished. It's like if you have girlfriends, you love your current girlfriend, you don't care about the one two girlfriends ago. Not that I have girlfriends anymore. I've been happily married for, you know, many, many years. Uh, but you fall in love with your most recent effort, and then after a few days, you start to see all of the warts and the flaws in it. And then maybe you correct it again or whatever. But, um, you know, I, I, I have paintings that have worked very well. Um, and I have paintings that have won tons of awards. Um, there is a painting called uh, uh, The Red Queen. It's a pastel painting. And uh, that won awards in almost every show I entered it in. There is another one uh, that I did fairly recently within the past year um, called On the Road to Mandalay. And that won awards in every competition that I entered it in and it sold. And uh, I could have sold that painting five times. Now, why that one? It all just worked. You know, it's, it's like there's a scene in the movie Little Big Man where Dustin Hoffman is talking to the, to the Native American chief. And the Native American chief is, has had it with life and all of the trials and tribulations. He lays down and he's going to die. And he's, so he's laying there. He opens one eye. Am I dead yet? And then he says to Dustin, well, sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. And that's the way it is with the painting. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes we don't even know why. You think, wow, I, I did everything that I know how to do in this painting. I think it's pretty good. Why is it not getting the reaction? And then maybe I come back to it in a year and I realize why. So I wonder sometimes why anybody should choose to paint figures or portraits. I'll tell you this, if you're doing a landscape and you move a tree over 20 feet because it fits the composition, who knows? 
it just makes for a stronger painting. You take a nose and you move it over a quarter of an inch, you've got serious issues with your painting. And so uh, I love portraits and figures because they're the most challenging. You know, it's like uh, if you're a, a scratch golfer, you don't want to play little short par three business golf courses. You want to play challenging courses. And uh, so portraits and figures are more challenging because they're, we're so used to seeing humans that we spot the errors. Even the most inexperienced connoisseur or viewer will spot every error in a painting right off the bat. So uh, it, it keeps you on your A game. I hope that this has been useful. I was very fortunate in that when I went to the American Academy, I had one of the greatest uh, figure drawing teachers, Bill Parks. And later on, after I got out of that school, my friend Dan Gerhardt told me that I should teach workshops, and I resisted. I didn't want to do it because I started late. You know, I was in my 40s at that point. And I told Dan, you know, I don't need the money. I don't want to do this. I want to work on my own art. And he said, no, no, no. You should teach for two reasons. One, you had great instructors and you owe it to the world to pass it on. And two, you will learn more by working with students than by just working with yourself. And I found both things to be true when I first taught a workshop. So these videos are really sort of a broad, a, a way to disseminate these workshops more broadly. But I always think I'm passing on the wisdom of Bill Parks, the wisdom of Harley Brown, the wisdom of Dan Gerhardt's, all of these great artists that I've had the privilege to teach me. And you know, I'm saying very little in these that are original. I'm mostly just, I'm, I'm blessed or cursed with a pretty good memory. And so I remember what people said to me. And, you know, um, C.W. Mundy said, you know, don't insult the viewer by spelling out every detail. Well, that sticks in my brain. So I pass that on to you guys. So thanks for watching. If you'd like to check out more of my artwork or look at my blog, I put a lot of information in my blog. You can go to www.schneiderart.com. And that's S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R-A-R-T dot com. Well, that was William A. Schneider, and the video is called Heads and Hands, and it's brand new, and you can learn more about the entire full video at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, in the comments section today, there's a very special today-only discount on that new video. Thank you for watching. About portrait paintings, Norman Rockwell once said, the viewer will forgive anything except heads and hands. When the heads and hands don't look right, the entire portrait looks stiff and tight, very unnatural. When proportions are not accurate, viewers will regard the work as amateurish. If you need help getting heads and hands just right, you'll be excited to discover the laser-focused instruction that artist William A. Schneider offers in the video course, Heads and Hands. Here you'll find new insights and shortcuts that will strengthen your drawing and painting skills. You'll be able to add Bill's expert techniques to bring expressive gestures into your artwork. In his entertaining yet thorough teaching style, Bill shares his best tips and tools so you have a solid foundation of knowledge that will help with every portrait painting you ever do. There's so much nuance to the human face. I mean, we evolved uh, to be able to express so much with our face. We're the naked ape. In fact, there was a famous book about that. And so we've got uh, movable eyebrows. The eyebrows tell you a lot about what somebody's thinking, you know, and here I'll, you know, are they got a furrowed brow? Are they looking at you? Are they quizzical or whatever? I mean, you get these different movements of the eyebrows and the movements of the mouth. And we are so attuned to seeing these subtle changes that indicate the underlying emotion. And so uh, I find that incredibly intriguing. Bill shares everything he's learned through his decades as a professional artist so you can avoid the trial and error that other artists suffer through. First, he'll provide a crash course in the anatomy of hands so you understand how the underlying structures are designed. This is what will help you attain a sense of natural appearance and movement. Then you'll follow along with Bill to paint a portrait from life. You'll learn Bill's signature measurement sequence that'll help you nail proportions so that painting heads and hands becomes second nature to you. 
Bill shares his techniques on how to enhance and refine your observational skills, as well as his simple fixes for the most common errors. You'll see him demonstrate his two-step approach to mixing colors and how you can paint accurate and striking facial features. When you study heads and hands with Bill Schneider, you'll be gaining new skills that you'll use for the rest of your painting career. I hope that this has been useful. I was very fortunate in that when I went to the American Academy, I had one of the greatest uh, figure drawing teachers, Bill Parks. And later on, after I got out of that school, my friend Dan Gerhardt told me that I should teach workshops, and I resisted. I didn't want to do it because I started late. You know, I was in my 40s at that point. And I told Dan, you know, I don't need the money. I don't want to do this. I want to work on my own art. And he said, no, no, no. You should teach for two reasons. One, you had great instructors and you owe it to the world to pass it on. And two, you will learn more by working with students than by just working with yourself. And I found both things to be true. Available on DVD and instant video. Order this video now and be on your way to overcoming the obstacles so many artists face when painting heads and